Christian missionary, William Barrett, tells the following story of a holy week he celebrated a number of years ago. He writes, The Good Friday service in Dampra Baptist Church in Chittagong, Bangladesh, was packed. Little children sat on the floor in the aisles and across the front of the church. Rows of people stood in the back, craning their necks to see the crucifixion scene as depicted in the movie, The Jesus Film. Weeping and gasps of unbelief could be heard in the shock hush as Jesus was crucified. As the Bengalis watched, they were caught up in the agony of Jesus' pain and the disappointment of his disciples. Right at this emotional moment, however, a young boy in the crowded church suddenly stood up and cried out, Do not be afraid. He gets up again. I've seen this before. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Don't you just hate it when somebody ruins the ending of a movie for you? Well, actually, the boy's heart was in the right place, of course, wanting to comfort his troubled friends. Even better, the truth be told, his message was actually right on target, hitting the very heart of what Easter is all about. God ruining the ending that death had written for his story. This is what it means to live a resurrection of faith. It means ruining endings. Ruining the endings death wants to work in the world. Are we living such a faith? Will we live such a faith? Or is this just some nice thoughts we're going to share here this morning that ultimately won't really change anything? This is what I'd like to talk about this morning. Actually living an Easter faith that works resurrection. Our text today is the final scene in the Gospel of John. And as mentioned, it's a couple weeks after Jesus' resurrection. You know, Peter says, I'm going fishing. And the other disciples agree to go with him and they head out and see and spend the night working hard but ultimately catch nothing. And in the morning, they're coming back to shore exhausted and empty-handed. Now, does any of this sound familiar to you? Because if you're a student of the Bible, it should. Why? Because this is exactly the way the story began. Peter and the other earliest followers of Jesus began their discipleship along the Sea of Galilee, having spent a, spent a night at work catching nothing, returning to shore to find Jesus calling them to cast their nets again, this leading to a miraculous catch. Note the symbolism. John ends his story exactly where things began, in effect asking, is anything actually going to come of all of this? They've been with Jesus all these years, they've witnessed his death, they've experienced his rising. Is it all ultimately just going to return to where it began? To mean nothing? To do nothing? The same questions the text is asking of the reader, of you and I. The great scholar once said, the real power of Easter is not just what happened on Sunday morning, but what we choose to make of it on Monday morning. Is anything going to come of all this? Is, is anything going to change? Or after all of this, after this, you know, some nice time here, some pretty music, some fellowship, we're all just going to return to the same old, same old, you know? This is the constant pull, you know? You just go back to how things were, you know? It was nice, but what of it? I got bills to pay, I got family to support, problems to deal with. See you next Easter. Well, would you like me something to actually come of this? In the text, Jesus shows up as before, but this time to push the issue, namely, to ruin the ending by refusing to allow this to be an ending. And how does he do, th how does he do this? He does it over food. Now, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Jesus was obviously a Methodist. Right? <laughs> it's always food. It's always food. That among <laughs> Jesus works with food here specifically over breakfast. You know, it's kind of like start your day with Jesus. Well, this is the image I would like to have us hold on to for a moment here. You know, it's well known the fact that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It sets the whole tone for the day, energy, attentiveness, attitude. Now, I don't know what kind of breakfast eater you are. Maybe you're one of those who loves a hearty breakfast, or maybe you're somebody who just growls at everybody every morning, just give me my cup of coffee and leave me alone. <laughs> Whatever, I don't know. But what I'd like to suggest, whoever you are, is starting each day with Jesus. Having breakfast with the risen Lord. Set resurrection as the tone for the day so that he might work in and through you, make something actually come of Easter. Now, what does this mean in a practical sense? Three thoughts. First, it means to expect a visit. Peter and the disciples have been out on a boat all night, they're coming back to shore having caught nothing, and much to their surprise, Jesus is waiting there to greet them, to turn their lousy night into a fantastic morning, and 
And what does Jesus do when they come to shore? He cooks breakfast for them. Think about it. Jesus shows up in their lives unexpectedly. And where does he show up? In some special place? In some holy location? No. He shows up at work. Understand, this is not some pleasure cruise they've been on. These are professional fishermen. And what does Jesus do for them? Does he simply work a miracle? No. He does the most basic thing possible. He prepares a meal for them. And this is the first lesson here. Jesus is alive and he shows up in our lives to bless us to turn ordinary days into extraordinary days. And he does this by showing up not just in special moments and special places, but in the most ordinary locations, in the most mundane ways. And the person who receives this, who best experiences this, is the person who expects it. They're tuned into it. They start every day having breakfast with Jesus, saying, Jesus lives. I therefore can expect a visit from him today. Sadly, many people don't go through each day with this thought, and thus they miss the visits. In fact, many church going folks, despite all the talk of the living Lord, don't really expect Jesus to ever show up. Even more, people outside the faith, they put down this whole thing, you know, Christians talking about, you know, what Jesus did in my life today. They chalk this up to coincidence or wishful thinking. Well, maybe that's true. But I don't know about you, but it, it seems that the deeper a person's faith gets in Jesus, the more the coincidences seem to happen. It's like a parishioner once told me about being out shopping one day, and she was, she was in line in the supermarket checkout, and the woman in front of her didn't have enough money to pay for the, the, the whole purchase. And she was 17 cents short. So this church member, a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, who believes in living, present Lord, tries to live to please him, she said, here, let me help you out. And she reached into her pocket and pulled out all of her change. And how much change was there? Take a guess. That's right. It was exactly 17 cents. Not 16 cents, not 18 cents. Not $2.35. Not 43 cents, two Canadian nickels, and a couple of dusty Tic Tacs. No, no. It was 17 cents exactly. Now some say that's just a coincidence. Our Savior says, there are none so blind as those who will not see. And I say this church member, like a lot of folks right here today, believes in a living, not a dead Lord, and is choosing to behave in certain ways because of that, and the Lord wants to reinforce such things, so He blesses it by stepping in and turning a simple act into something actually miraculous. I'm sure a lot of you have had moments like this. It's one of those moments where I tend to say, you know, Lord, now you're just showing off. <laughs> but hey, our Father in Heaven is a loving Father, and like any loving Father, He likes to show off for His kids. Don't believe me? Just try it. Just try it. Now some will say, Pastor, I don't, just, I, I don't buy any of this religious mumbo jumbo. In fact, sitting here right now, I don't really even think I believe in resurrection. I don't think I even believe in God, at least not in a present, active God. I'm really just here because somebody forced me to be here. I'm here to make Grandma happy, get a free meal, and go on with my life. <laughs> well, if that's you, then I say to you, Amen. If you doubt you are in extremely good company, every single resurrection text, including the one today, contains hints, if not outright statements of the disciples' serious, serious doubts. We're not talking about an absence of doubt here. They doubted. But what happened? In the midst of their doubts, with all the questions and the conflicts swirling around within them, they chose to risk believing, to take a shot that it just might all be true. And they were met with resurrection power. Doubt is important, it's healthy, but ultimately you have to ask yourself, what does my refusal to risk faith in an unconditionally loving God as revealed in the cross and the empty tomb, what does it get me? Because I can tell you what my faith does for me every single day. You have to question. But somewhere you also have to leap out. People will grab hold and leap out of despair and cynicism and hopelessness. Why not love and life and possibility? Now understand, all this doesn't mean that if we have faith in the living Lord, Jesus is just going to show up and make everything perfect. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You know, I'm reminded of an article I once saw uh, that contained some copies of children's letters to God. Some of the letters were things like this. Dear God, I went to this wedding, and they kissed right in church. Is that okay? It was disgusting. <laughs> so I knew. Dear God, I bet it's very hard for you to love all the people in the world, whole world. There are only four people in my family, and I can never do it. <laughs> and then there's my favorite. 
Dear God, thank you for the new baby bro. But as you may recall, what I prayed for was a puppy assigned to you. <laughs> God shows up, but he doesn't necessarily give us exactly what we want. You know? What God gives us is himself. To let us know he's there. He's got a hold of everything. It's okay, you know? That no matter what death may be around us, that his life is happening. He gives us life. Are we expecting him to stop by? Christian author Ruth Thickman writes, I came home one afternoon and discovered that the kitchen I had worked so hard to clean only a few hours earlier was now a terrible wreck. My young daughter had apparently been practicing her cooking skills, and the ingredients were scattered along with dirty towels and utensils across the counters and the floor. Needless to say, I was not amused. This on top of the terrible day I had already had, news of my husband's layoff from work and my father's cancer diagnosis. My heart broke. But then as I looked a little more closely at the mess, I spied a tiny, tiny note on the table, clumsily written and smeared with chocolatey fingerprints. The message was short, and it read, I'm making something for you, Mommy. Love, your little angel. And I had to laugh. In the midst of the disarray, and despite all of my great irritation and all my life's problems, joy suddenly vanished my heart. The note reminded me that God was there looking after me, in the mess that was my life, his angels were making something for me. First step in starting the day with Jesus so the resurrection might happen, expect the visit. Second step, refuse the hold of yesterday. Jesus welcomes the disciples ashore and he prepares breakfast for them. And it's not, it's not any old breakfast. It's not, you know, some stale old food loops or cotton crunch. Although I suppose if Jesus were to serve cereal, it would of course be Life. <laughs> Sorry. No. Jesus does some grilling. We get a little barbecue here, and let's face it, it's hard to top that. I mean, what's the old saying? Give a man some barbecue, and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to barbecue, and you won't see him for the rest of the summer. <laughs> Jesus does a little grilling. And as the text makes clear, he's not a gas grill kind of guy. He's, it's charcoal for him. John even highlights this. There on the shore, specifically, a charcoal fire awaits them, he says. Now, why is this important? Is it just some early product placement for Kingsford? Or should I say King of Kingsford? Sorry. It's a second, it's a second thing. Consider this. In the entire Bible, there is only one other reference to a charcoal fire. And that is in John's Gospel, chapter 18, Jesus has been arrested, Peter is watching from the courtyard, and as the text tells us, as he warms his hands over a charcoal fire, he proceeds to deny ever even knowing Jesus. Think about that. A charcoal fire is a distinct aroma, and they say that the sense of smell is the strongest trigger of memory and emotion. Have you ever experienced that? You know, a, a, a scent triggering a very strong memory. Well, the last time Peter smelled a charcoal fire, he was denying his master. He had failed hard. Now Jesus greets him over a charcoal fire. That scent is once again in Peter's nostrils. The pain is coming back. And what does Jesus say? He asks Peter three times, do you love me? Peter gets increasingly upset, saying, Lord, you know I love you. But notice what Jesus is, is doing. Peter had denied him three times, so Jesus now gives him the opportunity to affirm his devotion three times. Jesus takes that scent of failure and weakness and turns it into the aroma of forgiveness and love. And that's exactly what Jesus wants to do for every single one of us. Turn the stench of sin into the sweet perfume of grace. The second thing that happens here at breakfast is that Jesus makes it clear to Peter that he's forgiven completely forgiven. Sin taken to the cross, it's dead, it's gone, it's over, and it's dead. New life is before him. And this, I believe, is the second thing that the risen Lord wants us to start our days with as well. That in his death and resurrection we have been forgiven and are offered a brand new life. Go into each day choosing that new life. Essentially, the second point here is to know that we are not tied to yesterday. Today we can be brand new, no matter how badly we messed up in the past, no matter how much went wrong yesterday. So many lives are lost because they take one, one failure, one wrong, one injury, one problem, one setback, and they allow it to define their entire existence. Jesus says, no, this is a new day. Be new. This is the day that the Lord has made. 
The Lord, not your sin, not your failure, not your problems, not your obstacles. The Lord, rejoice and be glad in it. Basically refuse however the evil and death of yesterday is trying to hold you back from life today. One author writes, a new business was opening and one of the owner's friends wanted to send him flowers for the occasion. The flowers arrived at the new business site and the owner read a card which read, rest in peace. The owner was angry and called the florist to complain. After he had told the florist of the obvious mistake and how angry he was, the florist replied, Sir, I'm really sorry for the mistake, but rather than getting angry, you should imagine this. Someone that somewhere there is a funeral taking place today, and they have flowers with a note that reads, Congratulations on your new location. <laughs> Be about resurrection. Be about working life. In effect, be dangerous. 
be the one who, no matter where they are and what they're doing, is ultimately about getting sin and brokenness and death, the devil, really, on the run. Because Jesus lives. This is our final point here today. So many people, you know, all of us at one time or another, allow the devil to push them around every day, to push them, push them through the hoops, to set the agenda, constantly running in fear and trouble and death. No, Jesus says. Quit running scared and instead get this, the scary stuff on the run. Be dangerous to death. Be dangerous to evil. Be dangerous to the devil. Christ is risen. Christ I've lost it already. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. It doesn't look like that's going to get you. It should be automatic. Christ is risen. When you get up in the morning, that's what you should be saying. It shouldn't be you be thinking, how am I going to make it through the day? It should be the devil thinking, oh no, they're out. How am I going to make it through the day? Resolve to be dangerous. Resolve every day to work life because Jesus lives. Be different from the dead, dying things of this world. Do something, anything you can, no matter how seemingly small, to oppose the power of death in the world. To help someone know that the loving God lives today. Forgive, apologize, sacrifice, give, reach out, witness, whatever, and then watch resurrection happen. Amen. When author writes, in the fall of 2005, my nine-year-old son, Aaron, had his tonsils removed. Before the surgery, an anesthesiologist came in to start an IV. He was wearing a surgical cap covered in colorful frogs. Aaron loved the frog hat. And when the doctor started to leave, Aaron called out, Hey, wait. The doctor turned. Yeah, buddy, what do you need? Do you go to church? Aaron inquired. No, the doctor admitted. I, I know I probably shouldn't, but I know. Aaron then asked, Well, are you saved? Chuckled a little nervously. The doctor said, no, but after talking to you, maybe it's something I should consider. Pleased with this response, Aaron answered, well, you should, because Jesus is great. Yeah. I'm sure he is a little guy, the doctor said as he quickly made his exit. When Aaron's surgery was finished, the anesthesiologist came into the waiting room and talked to me. He told me the surgery went well, and he said, ma'am, I don't usually come down and talk to the parents after surgery, but I just had to tell you what your son did. Oh, boy, I thought. With a little rascal be now. <laughs> the doctor explained that, that he put, just put the mask on Aaron when my son signaled that he, he needed to say something. And when the doctor removed the mask, Aaron blurted out, Wait a minute, we have to pray. The doctor told him to go ahead, and, and Aaron prayed the following prayer. Dear Lord, please let all the doctors and nurses have a good day. And Jesus, please let the doctor with the frog hat get saved and start going to church, because he really needs to. Amen. <laughs> The doctor did this and touched him. Uh, I was so sure that he would pray that his surgery went well, he explained. But he didn't even mention his surgery or himself. He prayed for me. Ma'am, I had to come down and let you know what a great little guy you have. A few minutes later, a nurse came to me, taking me to post op, and she had a big smile on her face as we walked along. There's something you should know, she said. Some of the other nurses and I have been praying for that doctor for a long time. <laughs> He has so many problems in his life. Everything's falling apart. He really needs the Lord. After his son's surgery, he tracked a few of us down to tell us about Aaron's prayer. He said, if that little guy could pray for me when he was about to have surgery, then maybe I think I need his Jesus too. Long story short, good to his word, the doctor started going to church, found salvation, and gave his life to Jesus Christ. And his whole life began to turn around. The devil was stopping his tracks. And on Easter Sunday, 2006, when the doctor was to be baptized into the church, he asked Aaron to stand with him and to be his sponsor. And at the conclusion of the baptism, there at the front of the church, the doctor looked down at Aaron, and with tears of joy in his eyes, said, You were right. Jesus is great. He lives. And finally, so do I. We've told the story once again. Let us resolve to make something happen because of it. Every morning, have breakfast with Jesus and let him set the tone of the day. Resurrection. Expect a visit. Refuse to hold it yesterday. And be dangerous. Let us prepare to celebrate the sacrament of our Lord. Would you please turn to the great Thanksgiving count of page 13 in the front of the day.